Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. Today we are continuing Solved September and we are continuing it with a case that was pretty much on the very cusp of being solved ever since it originally happened, but it just took everything kind of falling into place to finally solve it. It's a very interesting case. I'm excited to get into the case, but before we dive into it, I do have to say that today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by an amazing company, Green Chef. Now, what is Green Chef? Green Chef is a food subscription service that will deliver easy to make meals with all of the ingredients required. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company that has dishes that cater to a variety of lifestyles, including vegan, vegetarian, paleo, keto, and even gluten-free. You can also switch up your preferred meal plan at any time. Ingredients are pre-measured, portioned perfectly. You get the exact amount of everything needed for every meal, so there's no waste. And most of it is already prepped. Everything is hand-picked and delivered right to your doorstep. You will also receive a very easy to follow step-by-step -step guide on how to make each meal. And these dishes are all insanely flavorful and contain a variety of organic, non-GMO, simply healthier ingredients. Green Chef is also the most sustainable meal kit out there, offsetting 100% of its direct carbon emissions and plastic packaging in every kit. Our lives are crazy enough. Let Green Chef do the meal planning. Green Chef works around your lifestyle and each dish only takes about half an hour to make. Now, if you've watched my channel for a while, you know that I've worked with HelloFresh before. We love them. I absolutely adore them. And Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh. So now they have this huge array of food choices to choose from. Both are similar concepts, but offer different styles. So I go between the two. It's all pretty much what I'm in the mood for at that time. Now, when it comes to Green Chef, I just I love how unique the dishes are. I've made things I've never even considered making before with this service. And I love the fact that there's no waste because I love cooking. I love messing around with new recipes, but after I'm done with a recipe, so much of the unused ingredients goes to waste and you just don't have that problem with Green Chef. One of the meals that I made <laughs> with Green Chef came with this yogurt ranch dressing and if you know me i love ranch and i am kind of glad that with green chef everything is perfectly portioned because i probably could have drank this dressing it was that good after hearing a little bit about green chef and today's sponsorship you might want to try them out well for a hundred dollars off across your first for Green Chef boxes, go to greenchef.us slash gabulosis100 and enter code gabulosis100. Thank you, Green Chef, for sponsoring today's video. I'm absolutely obsessed with your service and I can't wait to dive into many, many more dishes. So with all that being said, let's get right into the video. So today's solved September case, we are going to be Looking into the case of Joyce McLean. Joyce Marie McLean was born on September 4th of 1963 to parents Michael McLean and Pam McLean in Windsor County, Vermont, later relocating to East Millinocket, Maine with her family. In mid-1980, Joyce was 16 years old and to say she was well-liked and talented would be an understatement. Here is a photo of Joyce with her beloved saxophone. That was by far her favorite instrument, but she was one of those gifted individuals that could pick up most any instrument and be able to learn it in no time. She played in her school band, but playing music wasn't just something she did because she was in a group at school for it. She just loved music. She could write and compose her own music when she wanted to, and that was definitely one of her favorite things to do in life. Other than that though, she was very intelligent. She was an honor student. She was also athletic. She was a cheerleader. She was outgoing, kind, and the type of girl who could 
basically just uplift your spirits just by simply being around them. From everything that I read about Joyce, that was Joyce. Now Joyce attended Shank High School and in August of 1980, she was living a normal teenage life and she was getting ready to go into her junior year at school. She had many friends, so many friends, and she was the kind of person that people definitely gravitated to. She was a very sweet girl from everything that I read about her. No one really had anything negative to say about Joyce. She was absolutely gorgeous and she basically accomplished and mastered everything that she put her mind to but it it definitely wasn't something that ever got to her head she was just really humble and very caring and i really just cannot stress that enough when it comes to joyce she was just a, she was a kind person joyce was she was just a good girl she never got in trouble she was the kind of girl that any parent would be proud to have as a daughter and any school would be proud to have as a student. Now at this very time in her life, she was making plans and she had big life plans. She had just recently gotten her driver's license, which was something she was so excited about and a huge step in her life. She had college to think about. She had plans to attend college right after graduating. She also had a big birthday party she was looking forward to in September. According to unsolved.com, Joyce's mother, Pam, was quoted saying, Joyce's mind was filled with thoughts of what kind of a future she was going to have. She was heading into a new step in life. She was getting her driver's license. She was going to turn 17 years old. She had a big party planned at the beach with a big band and lots of friends and family was going to be there. I believe that it was a growing up time. Now, if you're already graduated from high school, I'm sure hearing about all of this may bring back the exact feeling that Joyce McLean was feeling in August of 1980. It was that feeling of being scared for the future, but also eager and excited and so very hopeful that things go as planned. But poor Joyce, she never got to see if they did. And according to people.com, Joyce's mother always had a feeling throughout the years that something bad was going to end up happening to her daughter. This nightmare though became reality on August 8th of 1980. On this day, it was a Friday, Joyce had spent it doing a fun summer activity. She had spent it swimming at a town pool with some friends. It was getting a little later in the day and most people would probably just settle in for the night, but Joyce was someone who, she always kept going. She was a cheerleader and she also played soccer and that next year she was set to play fullback. If you don't know much about American soccer or football as most everywhere else in the world calls it, a fullback is a player who will be lined up defensively to start off the game at the outer edges of the pitch. Now fullbacks are usually the fastest players on the pitch. Joyce really wanted to focus on her running and making sure she was in the best shape for the next season of soccer. So she was making sure to run very often or at least get some jogging in on the regular. The next school year was coming up soon and it was kind of crunch time to be physically ready for the season. So even after spending that entire day pretty much outside and being active, she wanted to get some jogging in. Originally, one of her best friends was supposed to go with her to go jogging, but at the very last minute, this best friend's parents wouldn't let her go. So Joyce simply decided to go alone. And at around 7.30 PM, she headed out for a jog. Unfortunately, that jog would be her last. Joyce had a usual route when she went on a jog. And this route took her around that small town that she lived in and right behind her high school. This was the way that she always took. Witnesses that day did see Joyce somewhere between 7.45 p.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. turning a corner, heading to the area of the softball field and soccer field that was behind the school. Joyce would usually do a few laps around this area every time she went out for a run. Now, Joyce, she obviously had a routine when she went out for a run and Unfortunately, when you have a routine, you never know who else is watching you while you do that routine. When those witnesses saw Joyce, that was the last time anyone besides her killer saw her alive. 
Hours passed and Joyce's mother grew increasingly worried. It had been a few hours and no one had seen or heard from Joyce and this was not like Joyce. If she decided to go somewhere else, like possibly a friend's home, she would have called her house and let her mom know, let somebody know where she was. Joyce was extremely considerate when it came to that. She never wanted her mom to worry. Pam McLean decided that she was going to go driving around the town to see if she could find her daughter. Joyce maybe could have been hurt somewhere. I mean, you never know, but that wasn't the case. Pam searched and searched for her, but could not find her anywhere. As time ticked by, every second felt like an hour. It does when you don't know where your child is. Pam went so many years fearing something horrible was going to happen to Joyce, and when Joyce didn't come home that day, Pam had a feeling that this was it, that her fear was finally happening. Within pretty much no time, I mean, everything happened pretty fast, a search was going on and people were trying to locate the missing teenager. Where is Joyce McLean? She went out for a jog and she vanished. Everybody thought the same thing. You know, something had to have happened. Two days after Joyce left to go on her jog, her remains were found. Pam wasn't just an overprotective mother. She wasn't just a worrisome parent. She had a feeling all those years, call it mother's intuition, call it a sixth sense, but Pam, she just knew. She knew, but always hoped it would never come true. A search volunteer named Peter Larley found Joyce's lifeless body in a little power line clearing near the woods behind the soccer field at the school, right near the area she was last seen two days before. Peter had actually been searching with Joyce's father the day before, and on that morning, he decided to go search by himself. Peter said that he saw her laying on the ground and that she wasn't moving. He said that she looked like she had been beaten and he had a gut feeling that she wasn't alive, but of course he didn't want to believe it. He yelled out to her. She didn't move. He ran home as fast as he could and phoned the authorities. Joyce was laying face down. She was, they said partially clothed, but she was only wearing her socks and her jogging shoes, and her hands were bound behind her back with a blue cloth. Her cause of death was a blunt force trauma to the head. Her skull had been fractured due to repeatedly being hit in the head with an unknown, very hard object. Evidence showed that although nearly completely naked, she had not been raped. Her clothes were found by a police canine in a rock wall not far from the location where her body was found. It was believed she had been murdered the day that she went missing. Now the area of East Millinocket, Maine, it's a quiet mill town, it's peaceful, it was not an area used to heinous murders. It's a little town in Penobscot County with a population of about 2372 in the year of 1980. We've heard of this type of town so many times before, one where, you know, everyone knows each other, people didn't lock their doors at night, and kids walked and rode their bikes pretty much everywhere. Well, that drastically changed after Joyce's life was taken. Joyce's murder hit this town like a wrecking ball. No one knew how to respond. No one knew what to think. A beautiful girl taken in such a tragic way and someone was responsible and that person was still on the loose and possibly, most likely, still in that area. People kept a close eye on their children. Doors were locked at night. People bought guard dogs. People took extreme caution to protect themselves and their families, all while Joyce's loved ones grieved. Here is a photo of Pam McLean and Joyce's sister, Wendy, in September of 1980, looking at photos of Joyce. This would have been the month that Joyce turned 17 years old. She never got to, though. She never got that party. She would be forever that 16-year-old that they loved so dearly. At the very beginning of this case, all emotions were at their height. Everyone's minds were running a million miles per hour, trying to figure out exactly what happened and who may have been responsible. This is when theory after theory 
arose. One of the very first theories in this case had to do with the exact area where Joyce's remains were found. This field was known as a local hangout where people drank and smoked. Some of the people that hung out in this area were said to be bad news and some individuals in that community focused in on that. It was theorized that possibly some locals to the area were there drinking a little too much, getting a little rowdy and possibly started messing with Joyce. You have to think, she was a young, attractive girl jogging all by herself. Maybe a group of young troubled men started harassing her. Maybe they wanted to take advantage of her. People brought forward this theory that possibly a group of people who usually hang out at this spot tried to drag her into the woods to sexually assault her and that one thing led to another. Maybe she started screaming and it ended in a murder. This theory, although no real evidence to back it up, was one at the very beginning believed by many at the time. Another theory had to do with workers in that area. Like I said before, East Millinocket was a mill town. Lots of paper mills in that area. That was a very popular job there. Some considered that maybe her killer possibly was a paper mill worker. There were a few hundred non-local paper mill workers in the area, so this made sense to some people. Again though, there wasn't really much evidence to back this one up, but it was a theory. In time though, even after multiple theories, Joyce's case ran cold. A little bit of time went on and another theory arose, and this is a small one, but it is one that some believed, and it has to do with the man who found her body. A lot of people started to think that maybe Peter Larley, who found her body, had something to do with it because it was just coincidental that he you know, came across her body when he was searching by himself. But again, there was just, there was no evidence to back this up. And within time, it just, it became another theory. Theory after theory came up in this case through the years and there were many possible suspects, but like in so many cases, everything had to fall into place in the right way and at the right time. The town of East Millinocket and Joyce's friends and family, they never let her be forgotten though and they really went above and beyond to keep her memory alive. Her case was truly a turning point in the town's history and it was never the same again after what happened to her. Still in current time, even after the case has been solved, that town is just not the same. Years and years passed and Joyce's case went through the usual ups and downs that cases go through over time. In the late 1980s, a petition was started by her loved ones to get her case featured on the show Unsolved Mysteries. This petition got over 6,000 signatures and her case was featured during season one of the show and it aired on February 15th of 1989. Like any case ever featured on the show, it brought much more attention to the story and people had hoped that maybe the case being spread so much more and so quickly that it would finally be solved. But it would be quite a few more years before that would happen. When it comes to Joyce's case, her mother, Pam McLean, is a superwoman. As I was researching into this case, her hard work honestly blew me away. She fought hard for this case. She worked tirelessly. She did everything she could to solve her daughter's case, even working with other volunteers to start a cold case group to help solve cold cases. There are quite a few times with cold cases where the case will eventually be solved and the person responsible will be someone that was never looked at by authorities for that particular crime. They were never questioned, they were never on the police's radar. For this case though, that's just not the case. Okay, so as we know, the night of August 8th, 1980 was the night that Joyce McLean's life was taken from her. But it was also the night of a car accident. Well, technically the car accident was the next morning around three in the morning, but we're just gonna say, you know, it was like that night. Okay, so a 19 year old local named Philip Scott Fournier. He went by his middle name, Scott, so we're just gonna refer to him as that. He was in a very severe car accident. 
after breaking into a garage and stealing a truck used to transport fuel. It was an accident that left him with severe brain injuries, one that left him in a coma for a period of time. This strange accident stuck out to police and they wanted to question Scott to see if he knew anything involving a local murder that happened that same night as his accident. They had to wait and wait and wait though because he was in a coma. When he was finally able to speak, authorities went in and questioned Scott about Joyce's case. He told them that he had no information to give them, that he had no idea who could have done such a thing. He basically told police that the fact that he had gotten into this huge car accident pretty much the same night that a girl was murdered in town, it was just, it was a huge coincidence that he didn't really know anything about her case. Well, over time, Scott's story would change and it would change many times. That story first really changed on May 15th of 1981 when he went to police and said he was starting to remember things differently that some strange memories were surfacing for him. He told police that he, he raped Joyce, that he hit her over the head with a telephone insulator and also kicked her in the head, that he killed her. But then he completely changed his story again and said that he didn't think these things actually happened because he would never do such a thing. He said he thinks his brain just made them up and that his brain was just doing weird things because he had gotten into that severe car accident and he had brain injuries because of it. Now I'm being honest when I say that I have never researched a case before that involved someone who changed their story so many times. Authorities had no solid evidence to prove that Scott had anything to do with Joyce's murder, and when they tested Joyce's body back in the day, there were no signs of rape. They truly believed that he had serious brain injuries and was just making things up. But even though they thought this, Scott was still someone on their radar for years, for decades. Scott was still someone they looked at on and off as possibly being involved, but they had no real proof and without proof and someone constantly changing their mind on whether they did it or not and changing the details surrounding it, what were they supposed to do? I mean, Scott was definitely somebody on their radar, the main person on their radar because for 35 years after Joyce was murdered, he was interviewed a total of 27 times. 27 times. You're not interviewed 27 times if police don't think you are highly involved in a case. Well, time continued to pass and technology continued to advance. In August of 2008, they ended up exhuming Joyce's remains in the attempt to find out as much as they could about her murder, hoping that with the new forensic developments, maybe they can find something else out they didn't originally find out back in 1980. They did a second autopsy on her remains and this time they found new evidence, but unfortunately this new evidence was really never released to the public. But that next year in 2009, which was the same year a huge article about Joyce's case was ran in People Magazine, Philip Scott Fournier was publicly announced as a person of interest in Joyce's case. They didn't seem to find any solid evidence to tie him to her murder at the time, but he was officially listed as a person of interest after being sentenced to serve six and a half years behind prison bars for possession of CP. He would stay a person of interest in Joyce's case for years before huge moves would be able to be made. His possession of CP and Joyce's case had absolutely nothing to do with each other, but because he was arrested and sent to prison. Sometimes if somebody is put behind bars for another crime, they will announce to the public that that person is a person of interest in a separate crime. Police would also end up interviewing quite a few individuals who directly knew Scott as well, from his parents to a minister to a couple that he knew. 
Everyone had things to say, but what this couple had to say was very interesting and definitely made police listen a little closer. This couple claimed that Scott told them that he was one of a few men that attacked Joyce and ultimately ended her life. This was something that Scott would end up bringing up himself as well. He told authorities during some interviews that multiple other men were there when Joyce's life was taken. And he flip-flopped his stories quite a bit with this narrative. One second, he would say that it was a group of them and they all equally took part in assaulting her and killing her. And then at other times, he would say that he was there, but was just an onlooker. And then again, he would change his story and say he was not involved in any way and that he just heard that a group of men assaulted her and took her life. It was very back and forth, back and forth. He even told police before that this group of men forced him to help them kill her. It was very confusing to authorities because he just kept changing his story and it was like this for years. And I can't even imagine how draining that was for police and her loved ones to deal with. And apparently he did this on purpose because a supervisor of his once told police that Scott told him he was responsible for Joyce's demise and he kept changing his story to mess up the investigation and mislead authorities even telling him there were no other men involved that he just made that up to. As time passed even more, so much information about Scott's connection to this case came forward and more and more people came forward with stories and supposed eyewitness accounts. For instance, there were witnesses who told authorities that they saw Scott near the high school not long before Joyce was killed and that he had a whiskey bottle in his hand that he had apparently been drinking. Authorities asked Scott about this and he told police that he used this bottle to hit her in the head repeatedly, that it was this bottle that he used to ultimately kill Joyce. According to this witness, Scott was also with another man that night. Two witnesses also came forward saying that the night that Joyce was murdered, they saw Scott running from that area where they would end up finding Joyce's body in a panic. That isn't even all though. The list goes on and on and his family even had information to come forward with as well. Scott's own stepfather said that he had his own bit of suspicious information to hand over to authorities. Ironically, only days before August 8th of 1980, Scott goes to his stepfather and says that he really wants to take up jogging jogging, the very thing that Joyce was doing when she was murdered. Scott's stepfather said that Scott, before Joyce was murdered, that he just, he came to him and said that he wanted to take up jogging. Now you can always ask the question, were these things just made up by people who knew Scott just to try to push police into finally arresting Scott for Joyce's murder? Well, police didn't believe that because you can say that somebody murdered somebody, that somebody you know, came forward with a confession to you that they took someone's life, but Scott, he knew distinct details about the crime that not everybody knew. For instance, remember when I mentioned him saying that he hit Joyce over the head with a telephone insulator? Well, a telephone insulator was in fact found laying next to her body when they found her remains how would he have known this information? That was information never released to the public. Second bit of information not released to the public was that Joyce had been menstruating at the time of her death. This was something that he also knew. He also pointed out the exact spot her body had been located. Again, that was not released to the public when he told it to authorities. He also knew the very tiny detail that Joyce had a ribbon in her hair the day that her life was taken. This man just seemed to know far too much. Most fingers were pointing to him, but the people working on the case really wanted to build a solid case before they ever arrested him and took him to court for 
a trial. Well, drum roll please. Philip Scott Fournier was finally arrested in March of 2016 for the murder of Joyce McLean. The trial began, and every single day of the trial, which was held at the Penobscot Judicial Center in Bangor, was very intense, and pretty much every day revealed new information that even people closest to the case had never heard about before. Anyone and everyone with any involvement in this case was present, unless they had previously passed away. For instance, sadly, Peter, the one who discovered Joyce's remains, had passed away previously from a heart attack, but pretty much everyone else was there, and tons of people who were highly invested in the case traveled long distances to be there for the trial. Scott pleaded not guilty, and his attorney was ready to fire back at anything that the prosecutors came at them with. One of the main things that his attorney basically suggested during the trial and really pushed was that Scott couldn't have worked alone. According to NewsCenterMaine.com, Fournier's defense attorneys suggested that others were involved or even knew more about the crime, but were never held accountable alluding that the state's witness, Grant Boynton, had provided false testimony in order to clear his name. When taking the stand, Boynton agreed that he felt targeted and even threatened by police after giving his statement to police in 1980. Boynton says the night McLean was murdered, he had been drinking with friends, including Fournier. However, he claims Fournier took off with another man, Leroy Spiron, and Boynton stayed behind. According to court documents, Boynton was later told by police that Fournier and two others accused him of murdering McLean, even going as far as saying Boynton had said he wanted to screw the teen. Boynton denied these accusations and said that he also denied them when speaking with police. When asked by prosecutors if he felt pressured into giving testimony, Wednesday, Boynton said, no, I came here to clear my name and tell the truth. Nolan Tanis, the man who says he saw Fournier and another man, Leroy Spiron, behind Shank High School the night of the murder, also took the stand, saying he remembered seeing the two there around 7.30 or 8 p.m., and that when he saw Spiron a little later on, he was white as a ghost and didn't know where Fournier went. At the time, Tanis thought he was just being silly because Spiron drank too much whiskey. Testimony was also given by Lori Nadu, who was the person who told police in 1983 that she saw Fournier running away from Shank High School the night McLean was murdered, as well as the man who reported the car accident that left Fournier in a coma for eight days, which happened hours after McLean was killed. Fournier told police that the accident was an attempt to kill himself. The trial was lengthy, the trial was messy, there were a lot of different people that took the stand with a lot of different things to say. But like I said before, Scott's defense attorney really just wanted to put people on the stand and question people that would help their point of Scott not working alone. His defense attorney also really brought forward every single original theory that I previously mentioned in the case, from the hangout spot to the local mill workers to Peter Larley being involved, but things just didn't look good for Scott in the court because over 60 people took the stand and many of them had information that pointed to him being responsible. One bit of very interesting information revealed for the very first time in this case was when Scott's stepbrother took the stand. His stepbrother claimed that only days before Joyce was killed, Scott confided in him that he had a crush on her, that he liked her, that he was romantically interested in her. Very coincidental. One of the hardest moments in court, though, was when they brought out photos of Joyce's lifeless body that they took the day that she was found. They were very graphic, and I can't really imagine what her loved ones were feeling at that time. It's heartbreaking, but it was needed. They felt that the intensity was 
It was something that was needed for a final decision to be made in the case. While the photos were shown, the original officer called to the scene, retired officer Rod Carr, took the stand and went over what he remembered from that day. While on the stand, he did bring up the fact Joyce had been on the later end of her period when she was found and that the killer would have known that information and Scott knew that information. Multiple people who knew Scott and even loved Scott took the stand and told in different ways and at different times when he had confessed to them that he was the one responsible for killing Joyce. Fournier did waive his right to a jury trial, so his fate truly lied in the hands of the judge. In the end, in February of 2018, Superior Court Justice Anne Murray found 57-year-old Philip Scott Fournier guilty of murdering Joyce Marie McLean. Philip Scott Fournier is currently serving a 45-year prison sentence at the Maine State Prison in Warren, Maine. When the verdict was announced, Joyce's family clapped and cried and hugged one another. It was a huge weight lifted off their shoulders, a weight that had been getting heavier and heavier for so many years. Of course though, like in most other solved cases, the family was happy the case was solved, but the man responsible being behind bars, it doesn't bring their loved one back. According to Banger Daily News, Joyce's mother said, it took 37 and a half years and you'll never see a happier mother than this one is right here, right now. How do we feel? We're here and this is the end. We have a lot of backing and we made it the last mile. McLean added saying she always knew that her daughter's killer would be caught, but found the trial traumatic. I wasn't prepared for the end. I wasn't prepared for the court time. I just wasn't prepared for this, McLean said. Speaking of her daughter, McLean said, we made it girl, we made it. We done this together. In the same article, Pam being the kind-hearted woman that she is, went on to say, I feel very bad for his family, his siblings and grandparents, his aunts and uncles. I feel very badly for all of them and will visit if they will have me there. I don't hate Scott. I don't hate them. It's over. So that is the case of Joyce McLean. It is solved, but like so many other cases, there are still so many loose ends, still so many questions left. Like what exactly happened that night? Were other people actually involved? Why did he claim he raped Joyce when there was no evidence of a rape taking place? He went on to later steal an oil truck and crash it. Why was he trying to take his life? Did he immediately regret what he did? Why was he tormenting police and the family for so many years if he did possibly feel bad? These are questions we may never know the answer to, but the important part is that the case, one that should have never happened, has had its resolution. Like always, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about this case. Joyce's case is definitely one that I spent an extra minute or two researching into. There was a lot of information online about it. And if you do wanna dive into a little bit more of that information, a little bit more of the, I guess, behind the scenes aspects of the trial because there was just a lot to it. I will have all my sources linked down below in the description for you all to check out. And with all of that being said, I will see you all in the next one.